bring in Carson Palmer, uh, former NFL quarterback. Uh, how would you respond to that if you're Jared Goff when your coach says that after a loss? Well, when, when Jared was a young quarterback and, and just kind of getting into the game and figuring things out like I was, you learn at a, a very young age playing this position that when you win, you're the hero. When you, when you lose, you're the bum. And there's too much put on you when you win and there's too much put on you when you lose. But I, I think the most important thing that he said, it was at the very end when, when he said he needs help because he needs help. I mean, they can't stop anybody on defense Offensive line's been an issue. They don't really have many playmakers behind him in the running back position or outside of him at the wide receiver spot. So when you lose, things get get heaped on you. But there's no doubt Jared Goff needs some help. Have you ever been called out by your coach in a press conference? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It happens all the time. I mean, most times when you lose, they say the quarterback needs to play better. And, <laughs> and obviously, I think mean, Jared would be the first to tell you he needs to play better. But there's no doubt. I mean, with with his skill set, he needs help. He needs playmakers around him because he doesn't have very many. Explain to me the Chargers got all this love last week, and then they go to Baltimore, and that was not an inspiring effort. Like, uh, as much as we should compliment the Ravens, Lamar Jackson and their defense, but the Chargers, it felt like, okay, let's see what you got. National stage, and uh, they did not produce. Why? They're not quite there yet. They're, they're not completely ready to be one of the premier teams in the AFC. They've got some really nice, nice things about them. They got their, a good young quarterback. They got a Bosa brother down there on the defensive line. Derwin James is an animal on, on the back end at defensive back. You know, at the end of the day, are, are you ready to, you know, all the hype you've been getting a, as a Charger, are you ready to go into Baltimore in one of the most hostile environments and put out and, and show out and, and prove that you deserve to be talked about as one of the better teams in the AFC? They answered that question for us. They, they went to Baltimore and got blown out. They're not quite there yet, but I'm not giving up on that team. I cannot wait to watch them. How they respond this week is really telling of what kind of team that is, what kind of leadership they have, and who their head coach is. Cardinals go to Cleveland, a banged-up Cleveland team, but they – they dominated them. That doesn't feel like everybody's all in on the Cardinals yet. What do you think is the big uh, reason why there's a holdout? Well, it's it's the you know it's the opposite of what we just said about about the Chargers. Can you go into Baltimore and win? Well, can you know can the the Cardinals, a four and team, go out east and and go into Ohio and beat the Browns? And they beat them decisively. It yeah. wasn't close. I mean, I know that team was beat up, but. The Cardinals have heard all that kind of West Coast bias. All, all the real teams are out there on the East Coast. They went into the East Coast, went into Ohio, and got a win that, that you know, they should have won. They, they were playing against uh, a team that was beat up. The Cardinals were extremely healthy. So, I mean, it, you know, it's the same thing we just said about the Chargers. If you're for real, Arizona, go to Ohio and, and leave no doubt on the field who the best team is. And they did that. They are for real. Everybody needs to, re to respect that team. They're 5-0 and for a reason. You know, they haven't started off uh, against some weak teams. They beat some good teams, especially this last week. Going into to Cleveland against a team you know is going to run the ball, try to run the ball down your throat. They went in there. They, they looked really good, and they look like the best team in the league right now. It feels like there's uh, – the NFC is top-heavy. you got five teams that are at least 5-1. and one. you got the Cardinals being undefeated. Dallas wins – Put up big numbers, but they allowed New England to take them into overtime. What do you take away from Dallas's win? A win is a win, yeah. especially when you go into New England. I mean, yeah, we, we'd like to walk out with you know a two or three score lead, but a win is a win. That the best team most of the time at the end of the day, especially when you go to overtime, finds a way to win. And I don't care if it was close. I don't care how many points they scored or how many points their defense gave up. Dallas is for real. They've got a really nice division uh, for them. They're sitting in, an, in a, at a good spot in a good division. Um, I, I just think they are for real, and they're going to make a run this year. Did you ever find yourself in a competition within a competition against that quarterback on the other team during a game of matching them to do your, your part, you know, the stats? You, you tried not to, um, but especially, I don't know if you're referring to, to Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray playing against each other, former teammates at Oklahoma, um, but no doubt. I mean, every quarterback wants to go in and throw for a little bit more yards, have a little bit higher completion percentage, and, and have a better QB rating. So 
Um, you, you can try to block that out and you can try to say, you know, it's just about our team playing well and winning. But I think, it, you know, at the at the root of every competitive uh, tussle between two teams, I think down there deep, both those quarterbacks want to have a better statistical day without a doubt. But did you find you did that when you faced Roethlisberger or you faced, you know, whoever, Brady, whoever you were facing oh, on a regular base, semi-regular basis? Absolutely. I would go in the locker room, you know, hopefully after a win and I would get the stat sheet right before I went into my press conference post game. And I would just double check and see where numbers were. So I, I think it's pretty normal. I would, I would assume just about every quarterback in the league does that. Yeah. Um, but can you, could, did you ever have a, a great game in a loss? Like can you, can you separate what you did as opposed to what your team did? No, I mean, at, at the end of the day, quarterbacks are the only position and, and really head coaches are the only guys that are judged on wins and losses, not on how many tackles they had or what their defense finished, you know, categorically at the end of the season. It's about wins and losses. As a quarterback, you're judged. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, what matters is the win. And then after you get the win, you can, you know, personally look at your own statistics and make sure that that you had better numbers than your opponent. But it's about the win, no doubt. What the hell happened to the Miami Dolphins? But they're who they're who we thought they were. I mean, a, a lot of people got you know jumped on the bandwagon, got excited about that team, got excited about Brian Flores, and you know he's the first you know Bill Belichick understudy to go on and have success. He hadn't had success yet. I mean that that team was really sexy preseason because they had all the draft picks, they had all the cap space. They're still not a very good football team. You, you know, they got a gift win against New England, and now they've lost five in a row. And then you lose to Jacksonville in London, and they don't have their first-round pick. Philadelphia has that. I mean, that's that's a tough situation to be. And then I don't even know if they're all in on Tua uh, because, you they're, know, they're, right? They're not. Yeah, they're simply not. I mean, they thought the Deshaun Watson trade, I think it looks like it, and it seems like, everything was pointing towards them being able to acquire Deshaun this off season. Obviously that didn't happen because of all the, the off the field stuff going on in, in Deshaun's life. But um, you know, I, I think they realized pretty early on that, that Tua might not be the right guy. That's why you saw Ryan Fitzpatrick playing early on. Um, and now you're seeing some real struggles. So I, I think that Deshaun Watson trade, uh, they were eyeing that they were hoping that happened. It didn't, so, I mean, they can have all the first round picks and, and they can have all the cap room. But if you don't have your um, your QB of the future, then you're still going to be constantly looking for him and, and wanting him, trying to trade for him, trying to draft him, whatever it may be in, in the future of, of Miami. But I just don't see Tua being the guy there long term. He's Carson Palmer, former NFL quarterback who joins us every Monday. The difference between college and pros, we hear this a lot. In in college, you throw to the guy who's open. In the pros, you have to throw a guy open. Explain that difference and how long did it take for you to be able to understand that concept? Yeah, in college, I mean, you have the the ability to sit back and wait for a receiver to get open and then throw it. So that the receiver, once he gets the top of his route and breaks in or out, can get his eyes back to the quarterback and see the ball coming at him. That's because in college, most guys in the back end run four, five to four, six, 40 yard dash. And so when you get to the NFL, just about everybody on the back end runs four, three to four, four, which means all of those windows are smaller. The ball can't be in the air for longer, for very much longer because defensive backs are closing on it. So you have to know that your receiver is getting up to 10 yards and he's breaking in and you need to throw that ball when he's about seven or eight yards past the line of scrimmage into his route so that when he rounds those last two yards and is coming in, he will not see the ball come off your fingertips. He will turn his head to the quarterback and the ball will be about halfway to him in the NFL and, and in college, you know, that, that small difference in a 40 yard dash time means those windows close extremely fast and guys are only open for really a very short period of time. And in college, you see, you know, you watch Oklahoma play, you see guys running, you know, wide open, butt naked down the middle of the field. You just do not see that at the NFL level. That's the difference between when you have guys that run four, three in college and you're playing against guys that run four, six. Once you get to the NFL, everybody's running four, three, four, four. So those windows and those butt naked receivers aren't running wide open down the middle of the field. That that's just a that's a football term, right? Butt naked. 
Butt naked, yeah. Every coach uses it. Oh, they do? You can use it too, Dan. Yeah, it's oh, cool. Okay, all right. So give me another term I haven't heard. Uh, that's clean. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, wait, that's wait, a tough one. What do you mean that's clean? That's you know family friendly. Yeah, but like I'm assuming this is Disney ish, aren't we on ESPN no, no, Disney? No, no, like no we're not. No, we're not. We're not on. <laughs> we're on. We're on Peacock. Uh, but yeah, Peacock. There you go. Butt naked open. Um, or or if we're on pe- Peacock, can I say wide ass open? Yeah, you can. You're sure, why not? Okay. So that, that works too. <laughs> I think that's a show on Peacock. Wide ass open. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um. You know, you start to look at Dak Prescott and you come off that injury. And we talked about this before where you can't think about the injury. And it seems like he's pretty comfortable in whatever. I don't like him throwing 50 times. It feels like they're a whole lot better when they run more than they pass. But what did you make of Dak Prescott? I think he's throwing the ball better than I've seen him throw the ball in the first five years of his career. Um, he, He threw on the run working his way up to the line of scrimmage, a high angle corner route that was one of the most beautiful balls I've seen throw this season. You're not seeing any lingering issues in his, uh, or his confidence, any lingering issues confidence wise and stepping up in the pocket, moving around. I've seen him break numerous tackles. He's not, you know, gingerly moving around. Um, You know, he's not overly concerned. You can tell, you know, as you know, year one post-surgery, there's always going to be naturally some some things holding you back. But as far as when he hits the grass and, and it's Sunday, he looks really confident in, in the stability of his leg. He looks really confident in the guys around him. He's playing with a smile on his face. I mean, there, there's no more pressure than a quarterback's playing under than, than Dak Prescott in Dallas for the Cowboys. So, I mean, he just looks he just looks back. He looks healthy. It's really fun to watch. Did people taunt like uh, th- this whole taunting rule? And and how players respond? Did did players did you ever taunt when you were in the NFL? Not really. I mean, it, it was talking trash. You know that that the fun part of talking trash um, is they're trying to kind of wipe that off the game. Um, you know, you think back to like one of my favorite players to watch ever was Philip Rivers. Philip Rivers would only be moving backwards if he were playing in today's game. I mean. He talked more than anybody, and and I guess you can call it taunted, but it was just talking trash, and, and it was part of the game. It was fun. Uh, back in my day, I mean, Chad Johnson, Chad Ochocinco sent a box of Pepto-Bismol to Cleveland before we were playing <laughs> Cleveland. He sent us the deep – is that taunting? Can you get – can you get a 15 yard penalty on Thursday if you send Pepto Bismol <laughs> to the to the Cleveland Browns? What are, it's just Phillip, getting out of control. What's Philip Rivers saying on the field? It's all clean. I've yeah, never course. heard him curse. <laughs> I, I, I've yet to hear him curse, but he's just having fun. I mean, that that's the game. You're allowed to talk. You sh- you used to be allowed to talk. You, you know, there was always um, some razzing going back and forth, and now it looks like and feels like they're trying to get rid of it. Um, but I don't, I don't think, I think, I think Philip would have a number of fines going into week seven. Uh, is it six now? Week seven. Seven. But yeah. so he would just say, you know, you can't stop us or, you know, you can't, you know, gosh, dang it. You can't sack me or. Yeah. Or don't try to bring that will free safety <laughs> blitz on me. And he throws it the other way for a touchdown. I mean, he was always constantly talking and, and that's what got him going. And it pissed off guys on the other side of the ball. But that's just that's the way that I grew up playing football in the game. I, I knew today's game. They're just trying to get rid of it, and it is what it is. Okay, but when a guy sacks you and he stands over you and then walks over you, like that always bothered me. That's where I want to, like, reach my hand up and, you know, hit you in the groin if you step over me. Did you ever- Yeah, that, that's, that's really disrespectful. At the end of the day, you're getting into being a respectful player by, you know, I, I don't think there's anything disrespectful about talking trash. But when you stand over a player or spike the ball in their fla- face or do the Allen Iverson Ty- Tyron Lou where he walked over him <laughs> after he hit that three pointer like that is that's starting to cross the line of being disrespectful. I think that's what they're trying to get out of the way and get out of the game. Unfortunately, when the league decides to get rid of something, they decide to get rid of it entirely. So you're not allowed to talk to any other, you know, any other player in the field that's not one of your team members. Uh, they're just trying to wipe it out of the game, unfortunately. 
Great to talk to you as always, Carson. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. That's Carson Palmer. His weekly appearance during the NFL season brought to you by our partner, Level Select CBD. Looking for next level relief? Visit LevelSelectCBD.com. 